Today's video comes with many thanks to PCBWay.com. Whatever your PCB needs, whether it's a single layer, simple board, or something more advanced like this, just go to their website, PCBWay.com, click on PCB Instant Quote, and every option that you can imagine is there. And if not, their support service is second to none to help you out, including their own PCB design service. It's all just the click of a button away. I do really appreciate them supporting the channel and making what I do here possible with their support. So uh, if you think they might be of interest to you, give them a click, check them out and see if they can help you. And now on with the show. What can we do with the Atari 800XL? What's it capable of and how does it stack up against the competition? Competition like the Commodore 64 back in the day. That's the question I aim to answer today. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave for part three of our Atari 800XL Trash to Treasure series. In part one, we learned about the history of this machine. In part two, we restored it back to almost looking like new, 99.9% .9 of the way there, because there was still one crucial part missing. And I think before we go any further and load any software, we should just fix that last 0.1 of a percent. So we had the missing brake key. And also there was another part which I didn't even know existed. I didn't know this was missing. So let's get those parts fitted right now. Now, thankfully to go with the key, I've still got the spring. I have got a spare plunger, but there's already one on the bottom of the key there. So we'll just drop the spring in and carefully clip this into place. That's incredibly satisfying. <laughs> Right, let's put this on. This is actually a bit dirty, so I'm just gonna give it a wipe first. I'm using nothing more than a bit of antibacterial spray. You'll notice over here, I've got an original Atari joystick and that comes courtesy of Mark. Um, so thank you, another Mark, for sending that in, not the same Mark as the original computer. It works so I can get the full Atari experience. I know it's not the best joystick in the world, but it's nice to get that authentic experience sometimes and just remind yourself how good or bad it was. I'm sure I'll be using the monster joystick again before long. And then we go on the back of the Atari, it's just covering the parallel port there. Clip that into place. Does the job, and in less than a minute, our restoration is complete. How much better does that look for having the brake key? It's so satisfying when a restoration all comes together and it just needed those final parts. So thank you to everyone for your generosity in sending in the bits that were needed to complete this. I really do appreciate it. And your names should have appeared on the screen as they were shown. And there's a lot more beyond those parts, things like this joystick sent in by Mark. Thank you, Mark. And some other bits that we'll see as the episode progresses. But right now I wanna get stuck right into the gaming and to see what this thing is capable of. And to help me with that, I've called upon the services of Mr. Lurch, fellow YouTuber who restored his own Atari 800XL not so long ago, and so has the jump on me in knowing what software is good. He spent a lot of time playing on it. So I'm gonna share with you the games that I've chosen, that I've discovered this week, good or bad, and the games that he's recommended. And we'll start now with my very first choice. Now there are around 140 games for the Atari 800, that is to say games that need the additional memory which is standard on the 800. The library is much bigger across the whole range of Atari 8-bits and it would be foolish to just limit our selection to a subset of the whole library. So I'm sharing with you this week any game from the library which runs on the 800XL. Any game that I've enjoyed discovering or been slightly disappointed with. And remember, this is essentially 1979 hardware repackaged in the 800XL, so just keep that in mind when we see what's on the screen. My first choice is Rescue on Fractalus. It comes from Lucasfilm Games and was, according to developer David Fox, inspired by the game Star Raiders and by the terraforming scene in the movie Star Trek II. This fractal generated flyby of a planet made quite the impression on David and he asked fellow developer Lauren Carpenter if such graphics would be possible on an 8-bit micro. I'll let David take up the story here from my interview with him last year. It kind of came about because I was office space with Lauren Carpenter for the first few months while they were getting our space ready. And um, that was one of the first questions I asked him was, you know, is it possible to do a fractal game on a 8-bit computer? And he kind of laughed derisively at first, <laughs> said no, and then started thinking about it and um, took it as a challenge, came back um, soon after and said, you know, there might be a way to do it. So we loaned him a an Atari 800, take, he, took, he took home on his free time and taught himself the innards of the machine and as well as 6502 assembly 
and came back literally I think it was like three days with a, a working demo and you know there, it was a demo of just it was there were no flight dynamics of just like you move forward or back um, through a terrain and uh, frame rate was decent it was like at least seven or eight maybe nine frames a second because there were, weren't a lot of extra overlap things on top of it and um, so wow okay we, we can do it and so a game was born, and as Atari helped fund the creation of the games division of Lucasfilm, they'd invested $1 million into it, they had first refusal on their games, and of course, they wanted this game. It's really for the breakthrough in fractal graphics that I wanted to try it out, and it works very well, allowing you to swoop around through the valleys in a way that you might mistake for Star Trek 2 if you kind of sit back and squint a little bit. Gameplay-wise, I'd add Williams Defender to its list of influences, as the goal is to rescue fallen pilots from an alien planet in your spaceship, very much like Defender, a planet taken over by the evil Jaggies. And Jaggies is indeed a reference to the stepping effect in graphics which is smoothed out using anti-aliasing techniques. The 800 didn't have the colour palette or the grunt, I mean, come on, just creating them was enough, what more do you want? It's a simple concept though, with a fairly complex execution as you have no less than 19 dials on your spaceship's control panel to help you land near the pilots, who will bang on the door of the ship to be let in, and all while under the attack of the Jaggies. And this game would be ported over to other systems such as the C64, but it's here on the Atari 8-bits where it started. That's my first choice of game, let's see what Mr Lurch has for us for his first choice. G'day fellow cave dwellers. A little while ago, I did my own restoration of an 800XL. So when Neil kicked off his Trash to Treasure, I was like, would you like some game recommendations? So here we go. First on the list has got to be Boulder Dash, specifically Boulder Dash 2. I think it's a really great game and really fun to play. Mr Lurch's first selection is rock hard, and I don't mean that as a pun, it's brutal. Boulder Dash is a game that needs both quick reactions and planning ahead to make sure you don't get trapped, and sometimes both at the same time, which is when it gets really hairy. This clip is essentially a montage of me dying many, many times, but it definitely had that pull to make me want to go back and keep trying again and again. It's not a game that shows off the colour palette, this cave looks positively CGA in its magenta tones but it does hold its own against the Commodore 64 version, which looks quite similar. The colours do change as you progress through to different caves. The Atari's smooth hardware-assisted scrolling does see it easily keeping up with the Commodore, and it is superior to versions on other 8-bit micros like the Amstrad CPC for that very same reason. It just doesn't scroll as smoothly on the Amstrad. Boulder Dash 2 is infuriatingly fun on the Atari 800, and if anything is going to break the joystick today, it's likely to be this game. Goonies never say die, and of course I had to try this out because it's one of the tapes that came with the Atari 800XL when it arrived here in the cave. This is a puzzle game with a fun mechanic in which you play two of the Goonies and alternate between them in order to make your way through a single screen level. So here I am pushing a chair over with one character in order to jump up on it into the money press and spew money all out of the window, which distracts the evil Mama Fratelli and lets my other character slip down into the caves beneath the house. It's nothing at all like the NES game of the same movie, but it's also available on other 8-bit micros. What got me most about this game was the looping music, which had me wondering, how does the 800 stack up sonically compared to the king of the 8-bit micros when it came to music, the Commodore 64? And so, for a very quick and dirty comparison, I fired up the last V8, an average game at best, with a killer soundtrack by Rob Hubbard. So here's how it sounds on the Atari 800XL.
And for comparison, here it is on the Commodore 64. For me, the Commodore 64 is a clear winner, thanks to the flexibility of the SID audio chip, but the 800 puts in a good performance for hardware which, as I'll keep saying, dates back to 1979, so I don't think we should be too harsh on its efforts. The Atari did try to hit back in 2019 with a hack of the last V8 by Homesoft. This added the loading screen seen in the C64 version and the sampled speech which was in that same C64 version. So we know now that the 800 is perfectly capable of that, but the Rob Hubbard music remained the same. I say Rob Hubbard, he did admit in my interview with him that he often gave his wife the job of porting his tunes to other platforms while he was out gigging with various bands, so thank you Mr or Mrs Hubbard. Secondly has got to be Arkanoid. Now, Arkanoid is available for every platform under the sun, but it works really well on the Atari line, especially if you use the Atari paddles. Arkanoid does indeed support paddles, which is really how this game should be played, but I found it enjoyable enough on the joystick. It didn't feel unfair at any point, which is the key to any good breakout clone, and Arkanoid is the classiest of them all. Absent from the Atari 8-bit version is its distinctive title screen and music, especially the music that plays as the round begins, so it loses a little bit of character because of that. It's perfectly capable of doing it, they've just chosen to omit it when porting it. Graphics-wise, it looks really nice, it moves smoothly. I think the quality of the sprites and the range of colours is just as nice as any other 8-bit micro out there. The screen is a lot less cluttered, because on this port they've chosen to place the score and your lives at the bottom of the screen as opposed to the box on the right hand side that you find in other micro ports. And this is actually more authentic to the arcade original which had the text at the top of the screen, but that's because the arcade monitor was in a portrait orientation. It was tall instead of wide, so home conversions which don't expect you to tip your TV up on its side for obvious reasons, chose to use the extra pixels to the side of the playfield. Nevertheless, I do like this uncluttered look. While I don't have a set of Atari paddles, it did get me thinking, can I play Arkanoid with the trackball? And to figure that out, we should take a break from the gaming for a moment and give this quite rough feeling trackball a service. This, like so much else that comes into the cave, is going to need a good clean. There's a lot of uh, disgustingness trapped in all of the nooks and crannies and the ball will need a clean. You can't actually twist it to open it out and pull that out. We have to um, unscrew it from below and all of the screws are under these feet, two of which are missing. So I want to get a couple of replacement feet. And if you need to replace these yourself, these measure about 12 mil in diameter across the center. what's lurking inside for us. Top lifts off nice and easily. You've got the two buttons there which make contact with these pads onto the circuit board it can't miss. Uh, oh, that's nice. All of the uh, cables are actually labelled by colour on the board. Yellow, green, red, brown, violet, blue, grey. <laughs> nice, unless you've changed the cables. So does that just lift out? There are no screws holding this board in. It's only the tension of the cables, which I don't want to force. And I can already see rust on the rollers. 
Okay, and I think the board can remain in place because just by releasing those screws, it does allow us to lift these rollers out. So the ball rubs against these for its X and Y axes. There is another smaller one, which we'll get to in a minute. This spins and then an optical sensor as it spins detects the gaps in the teeth here to figure out if it's moving or not. Uh, there are some ball bearings in the end here. To do this, I'll just soak the rust in some vinegar and that will hopefully get it shifting. Hopefully it's only surface deep. Uh, it certainly feels that way. I think there's too much for just the cotton bud alone, although there's lots coming off. I think we're going to resort to uh, some light sandpaper to try and get through this. There we go, they've both come up rust free. I have taken some of the paint off with it in the process. It shouldn't be a problem unless we find that we don't get traction with the ball itself. What we'll do next then is give the bearings some TLC. You could replace all of the parts in here, but it's nice to try and use them in the first instance. First, I wanted to clean out any old gunk while avoiding the obvious puns about clean balls, so I swirled them around in some acetone. That should help to release any old oil, rust and dirt debris from the bearings, and then I wiped them down. If you have the tools and skills to completely strip this of his bearings and clean them individually, then great, but this technique should be adequate to get them cleaned up today. I used a cotton bud and also a cloth with a small screwdriver to poke around in there and wipe them, but it's really the acetone that's doing the hard work for you. You're just wiping away what comes out. Once cleaned, the bearings got a few drops of oil to lubricate them. I'm using regular old three-in-one oil. This is not a job for WD-40, which is a very light lubricant and degreaser. Three-in-one oil will last much, much longer on those bearings. There's also a third roller in the track ball, which isn't electrically connected to anything. It just helps the ball to move in a diagonal motion. And that can be flicked out with the help of a screwdriver and the bearings cleaned in exactly the same way as the others, and then also lubricated with the three-in-one oil. quick clean out of the casing and then our final job is to remove any dirt from the ball itself. I've used washing up liquid and then I wiped the ball down with some window cleaner just to cut through any residue left from the washing up liquid and then I gave all of the plastics a good clean up. The result is a trackball that moves pretty freely. We must remember that it's a low cost consumer grade trackball. This isn't an arcade quality trackball but it does feel good. The proof however is in the testing. The trackball has a switch to enable trackball or joystick mode, so while Arkanoid doesn't support an analog trackball input, you can use it in joystick mode, and it works surprisingly well, to the point where, yes, I would absolutely choose to use this over a joystick in Arkanoid. It makes the game immensely playable. And yes, of course, this being an Atari, I had to try out Missile Command, and it worked wonderfully with it. This trackball refurb has been a success and it makes the Atari 800 XL experience all the better for it. So let's get back to gaming and see what my next choice is. My next choice of game is Zybex, which is a really pleasant surprise to find. Released in 1988, this is a nod to the later horizontal shooters of the decade, such as R-Type, rather than the more simplistic affairs of the early 80s. And it actually pulls it off really well. Thanks again to its hardware sprite handling, everything zips along without slowdown, and plenty of bullets and enemies flying around the screen at once. Now granted, there are no fancy backgrounds or parallax scrolling as you might find on the C64, but the uncluttered nature of the game means you can only blame yourself when you get hit. It really is a hidden gem that I hadn't heard of before tinkering with this system this week. There's no in-game music, but the title music is a nicer composition on the system than we just heard in the last V8. <laughs> 
and the in-game effects are functional in their nature, but the enemy patterns and variety are fun, and this feels like a solid port of an undiscovered arcade cabinet from the period. I think you're going to have to work hard to beat this one, Mr. Lurch. Thirdly is a game called Drop Zone. It's a kind of back and forth side-scrolling shooter that's really, really fun to play and really easy to get addicted to. He certainly made a strong choice that takes us back to those earlier arcade scrollers of the 80s. Drop Zone is Archer McLean's homage to Defender. His goal is to create something that looked so good it could go in an arcade cabinet, and I think he achieved it. Archer said he wanted to squeeze the Atari 800 to its limits and make it better than anything else out there, even on the C64. And I have to say, you really could stick this in an early to mid 80s arcade cabinet and pass it off as an arcade classic. It has big, smooth sprites, thumping sound effects, which really do sound like they might have come from a Williams arcade cabinet, and I especially love the particles when the player explodes into a million little pieces. Very satisfying. Archer's publisher claimed that they were no longer selling the game after 18 months, but little did they know he was a very well-travelled man, and he would buy copies of his own game on his travels, carefully retaining the receipts as evidence. He was especially disappointed to see the game was on sale in the US because it was created for 50Hz systems and wasn't optimised for the 60Hz in the US. After four years of legal wranglings, he managed to get the publisher to settle out of court and promptly bought himself a Ferrari. If only someone had put him in charge of those terrible outrun ports on the 8-bit micros. Speaking of cars, another tape that came with this system is Arcade Classic Spy Hunter. So of course, I wanted to see how this ran. I always loved the sitting Spy Hunter cabinet, blasting out Henry Mancini's theme from Peter Gunn, and I'm pleased to hear that it's made it into the game. But other than that, this really was my first disappointment on the system. Sure, it scrolls fine, but the whole game just feels a bit empty. I'm sure there was more traffic in the arcade version. You do eventually get to see the variety of enemies with their spiky wheels and the helicopter dropping bombs on you, but it just doesn't come together very well. I guess the quirkiest thing I can tell you about this game is that it supports two joysticks. You can use the second stick to fire the smoke screen or oil slicks behind you, and the main stick to steer or shoot ahead of you, which is novel. But if I've got two joysticks, I'll be playing the excellent Robotron port on the Atari 800, and not this game, thank you very much. As friend of the channel Mean Machine Dean might say, Spy Hunter can get in the bin. Next. Lastly is a homebrew game from 2007 called Yump. It's kind of a 3D tunnel jumping game and it's really relaxing and really easy to play, but the graphics and the sound that come with it is absolutely outstanding. From the mediocre to the absolutely incredible. This is what comes out of a machine when a developer has had an extra decade to master it. Released in 2007, Yump would look impressive as an entry in a demo competition, but it's actually a complete playable game, and a very addictive one at that. It takes a familiar game, namely Trailblazer, in which you guide your bouncing ball through a course, but it wraps that course into a tube and throws a hypnotising soundtrack over it, which your ball bounces in time to. It all comes together gloriously and you find yourself planning your next move in time to the beat of the music. You really can't help but nod along to this one, it's nearly a rhythm game in its execution. And it's a great way to see everything that this machine is capable of being thrown at it all at once. Well, I hope spending time in the cave today has helped you to better understand what the Atari 800XL 
and its Atari relatives in the 8-bit range are capable of. Don't take today as the top 10 games, the very best games that you can play on the system, because it really has just been Mr Lurch and I feeling things out and sharing with you the highlights that we found along the way. There's a huge amount more to discover. Things like Jeff Minter's Attack of the Mutant Camels, which makes full use of the sprite hardware and all of the colours and everything that makes this such a fantastic system. And a lot of you will have been shouting, show us Mule, show us Mule. Of course, Mule is the game that is the godfather to real-time strategies today, and it originated on the Atari 8-bit computers. There's just too much to fit into one episode, but I hope that you've got a feel for what the machine's capable of. And you may have noticed that both Mr Lurch and I have been using a device here to load our games, and I'll just show you that quickly because it might help you at home to get the best out of your own Ataris. These are those devices that let you load games from SD cards to make the whole experience quicker and more enjoyable, particularly for those of us who remember using tapes. Now I've got two here, the S Drive Max and the Uno Kart A8. Now between the two of these I started with the Uno Kart and I've had nothing but problems with it to be honest with you. If I try and load cartridge ROM rips then fine that works no problem and this does indeed go into the cartridge slot of the micro. But anything else, it's really, really hit and miss. I'd say about 80% of the things I try don't work. That's not to say it's completely useless. This particular one says it's for the Atari XL and XE computers, but there are other Uno carts out there that support the consoles. And I think that'll be great. It's the perfect solution for your cartridge backups. For this system, however, I recommend the S-Drive Max. It uses the SIO port, which is the same port that original disk drives and tape drives use. So it's not trying to do any trickery through the cartridge slot, which might be part of the problem. On the touchscreen here, you can see that it emulates up to four floppy drives and one tape deck, and you can load it up from the touchscreen with the files that you want, or you can use the on-screen program to select your title. I've had much, much more success with this than I did with the Uno Kart. And yes, you can load up all four of those emulated disk drives all at once, as if they're on one big SIO bus daisy chaining one to the other and use them all at once. It's a wonderful thing. And the cassette deck, should you want to use that. So I do highly recommend this, and you'll find a link in the video description if you want to get one for yourself. But there is one thing that I do want to mention to you about the Atari cassettes, because there's something very special and unexpected about some of these. You see, the cassette deck on the Ataris, on the 8-bit Ataris, they seem to use a stereo head instead of a mono head that most 8-bit micros that I've used in the past use. And some software has picked up on that and makes the most of it. I need to show you the waveform of a cassette to show you what I'm talking about. Take a look at this. So if we were to play this tape as if it was loading into the micro, you can hear the modulated data screeching into the micro on one channel. Nothing unusual about that. But as the tape goes on, something else happens. Yeah, there's an audio track on the other channel because of that stereo head, it can do that. Can you name the birthplace of Oscar Wilde, George Bernard Shaw and James Joyce? So if you were lucky enough to have a television and you could balance the stereo left and right, you could turn it all the way to the right or whichever channel it is, get rid of the sound of the data and just enjoy that other channel. How cool is that? Why didn't more micros do that? Well, I know why they did it, because it was a cost reduction choice to use a mono head instead of a stereo one, but Atari went with it and they found a fun way of using it. So um, that's something you need to be aware of, but I do still recommend the SD card solutions in the modern day to get the most out of it. And so, as we draw to a close another Trash to Treasure series, I must say thank you for the incredible generosity of the viewers and the Atari fans out there. You guys have sent in joysticks, games, peripherals, so much stuff to load out this 800XL, not just to restore it, to, but to um, give me the chance to display an incredible example of an Atari 800XL, as you'll see shortly in some glamour shots. So I just wanted to say a special thank you to everyone who's watched this, but also who sent things in to make it such a fantastic restoration. You know, one day I really hope to be able to put displays like this in a place where you can access them, where you, the cave dwellers, can actually come and visit and hands-on use them uh, to enjoy them because it's such a shame for me to restore them and then put them on a shelf. Yes, I make videos with them and I try to help you to enjoy them in that way, but I'd love for you guys to be able to come in and actually use them. So one day I hope to make that dream come true with your support. And if you'd like to help me to support that, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash retro man cave, where I'm building up a support of cave dwellers who have made this much possible, who would have dreamed we would have made a set like this and a channel like this in the space of a few short years. And with your support, who knows where we can go next. 
My goal is to put these systems into your hands. Until then, I'll carry on restoring them, and I hope you continue to enjoy the videos I make about them. Until next time, this is the Atari 800 XL. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed today's video and what I do here in general, then consider heading over to patreon.com forward slash retro man cave, where a small contribution will give you access to all videos one week early without any adverts, but most importantly, you'll become an official cave dweller. I hope to see you there and thank you.